Before I embark on any new and loftier endeavors, I have to close some old business. My new commitments no longer permit me to have protracted arguments attempting to reason with reality denialists, so I'll use the most recent one as a summary of what they're usually like. This last one was a monotonous, four-month-long discussion with a YouTuber known as Once Forgiven, Now Free. Have you ever been told that evolution was a fact? Or maybe you've been pressurized to believe in evolution? So I want to issue a challenge to evolutionists, and here it is. It should be very simple. Prove it. Prove that evolution is a fact. This comes up a lot, and it needed to be addressed. So I couldn't help but answer that challenge, especially when I saw that his video is labeled Fact or Faith. That means that I have to show how different aspects of evolution are objectively verifiable. That's what makes evolution a fact. So just remember that I want actual proof. Don't come back with a one-word answer like genetics or fossils or DNA. A word is not an argument. And an argument is not evidence. But it is a good way to reason with someone who doesn't understand evidence because they don't know the significance of the facts presented nor what they indicate. Thus, I can't simply show the evidence to someone who doesn't know what we're talking about. They first have to understand what it means, and that requires trying to reason with them. You have to actually construct an argument where the conclusion logically follows. The conclusion being that all life on Earth is descended by a blind, random process, not design. Whoa, wait a minute. Am I supposed to prove that evolution is a fact, or am I instead supposed to disprove design? While natural processes may be blind, natural selection is not random, and evolution is certainly capable of design. But OFNF is clearly talking about deliberate design for an intended purpose, so he's not asking me to prove that evolution is objectively verifiable. He's obviously posting a very different challenge, the same false dichotomy that all creationists use. Random chance versus intelligent design. Theism versus atheism, not whether evolution is a fact. Your argument must be sound, which means that your argument has to be valid and your premises have to be true and you have to defend them and show that they are true. And so my challenge is that simple. If you want to claim that evolution is a fact, prove it. Okay, so if I hold him to the first part of this challenge, to prove that evolution is a fact, then I should be able to do this in three steps. First, I want to make sure that he doesn't go move the goalpost. So we'll have to establish exactly what we're talking about what a fact is, what constitutes proof, and what evolution is, because it's not what he makes it out to be. Then I would lay out the general facts of evolution and see what he already accepts, what he doesn't know about yet, and what else he would need to see in order to convince him. Whatever he already accepts, we'll leave alone and focus only on what he rejects. That is what I'll have to prove. And it'll be easy to do, but it'll require some uh, citations, illustrations, and to keep him focused and on task, we'll take some very specific Q&A. It must be an interactive discussion, and I think this would be best done in writing as a matter of public record. I tend to use the League of Reason forums for that purpose. I post it to other places, but if it's on my own site, then somebody might accuse me of tampering. If I post to religious forums, they'll often censor it. A couple Christian sites have either blocked certain words or deleted whole posts altogether, but I know that won't happen on this forum. Notice that I've already brought a half dozen other creationists here attempting to prove evolution to them, but they've all followed the same pattern of dishonestly ducking and dodging every point or query necessary to prove the case. So I predicted that OFNF would do the same. I posted a thread accepting his challenge to prove that evolution is factual, but stressed that I would not submit any work that he could simply ignore and dismiss unconsidered, because that is obviously what he intends to do, and I won't play that game. I would only explain this in a two-way conversation because I want him to understand what I'm saying and to acknowledge each point as we progress. These are the terms he accepted. Yet he complained in his very first post that I haven't shown him any proof yet, after I explained that it had to be an interactive process and before he even accepted the terms of our discourse. This shows that I guessed his game correctly. Obtuse incredulity and a shift of an imbalanced burden to proof are the only strategy he has. The first point of contention was what the challenge actually is. I can prove that evolution is a fact, but I can't prove that it's not what it is or that it doesn't do what it does. Nature is capable of design, so that is the first correction to be made, and it is a different challenge than proving evolution to be a fact. Then do I have to disprove God at the same time? I shouldn't, because the definition of evolution does not say that it necessarily excludes intelligent supernatural agencies. Now, I, I have no idea where he got this whole... Thing about disproving God or the supernatural. I never mentioned God, but whatever, I can just clarify that and move on. 
He painted evolution as random and juxtaposed it against design. Then he clarified that he was talking about an intelligent designer and that his challenge to me was to disprove design. Yet even after reading my explanation, he still doesn't understand how his magical, immortal, intelligent agent must necessarily refer to a god. This was the first question he refused to address. And so now he tells me that I'm wrong about my challenge, I guess. I didn't know I could be wrong about my challenge. His challenge is wrong because it either requires me to misrepresent evolution or to disprove design. In either case, it negates itself with regard to whether evolution is a fact. They're two different challenges. There's also an imbalance to the burden of proof because he expects me to prove that nature can act without the aid of a creative deity. However, if that were the challenge, then my criteria is already met because theism is not the default position. Not only is there no indication that any god ever existed, but there is substantial evidence that his god is imaginary. If he wants me to consider his intelligent designer, it's up to him to show that there is one. It's not up to me to show that there's not, and I had to illustrate that for him. He imagines that any interpretation of design can only come from an intelligence with a goal in mind, because he has no concept of emergent complexity. So he's using a combination of the first and seventh foundational falsehoods of creationism, because he also said that evolutionists reject God, as if accepting evolution turns one atheist. In fact, several notable evolutionary scientists hold traditional Christian beliefs. I even named a few such people for him to ignore, and of course that's what he did. He complained that I said that he didn't know what he was talking about, and he proved that again. He didn't understand about cumulative mutations and a random assortment not always being significant enough to be subject to selection. He thought every mutation had to be selected in a stepwise fashion. I had to explain a lot of the basic elements because he didn't even understand what evolution is. Yet he still complained that I haven't offered any proof yet. He wants me to finish before we get started, before I can explain anything to him, before we've defined what the words we're using even mean. So what is it, Aaron Ra? Are you just wasting my time here? I mean, here's what you said. Dawkins was right. It is easy enough to prove that evolution is a fact. Well, wh why are you playing these games then, right? Can just give us the evidence. If it's easy to prove that evolution is a fact, show us. Please, I actually want the evidence for evolution. So we went over the definitions, and I asked if he accepts them. I had to repeat those questions because he ignored it the first time, but then he accepted all the definitions as stated without argument except that he still refers to himself as a skeptic. As a credulous creationist who believes extraordinary claims on insufficient evidence, he is the furthest thing from a skeptic. He also calls himself a free thinker, but adheres to a belief system with required beliefs and prohibited beliefs, and is thus not free to believe anything else. So he doesn't seem to know what these words mean either. Having completed the first steps, clarifying the terms and establishing definitions, I moved on to the next step, lay out the facts asking which ones he accepted so that I'd know which ones I'd have to prove. He ignored them, trying to sidetrack. He wasted a lot of time puffing up in pointless posturing. And if you're still waiting for evidence for evolution, I think it might still be coming. Aaron Ra is just, I don't know, he's taking his time, and we have to be very patient. We don't want to scare him away. As if... He projected a lot, too. He criticized me for being condescending while he accused me of being the one with an invisible friend. He distorted a lot as well. Any attempt to remain on track he described as sidetracking, and every question necessary to remain on point he referred to as rabbit trails. So I listed the facts of evolution again and challenged him to show his own facts of creation. Creationists hate that because, of course, they have no facts on their side and will not accept any burden of proof. He and his associates on the panel even insisted that I should defend his strawman version of evolution rather than what it really is. Previously, OFNF said that he, like all other creationists, accept evolution up to a point. Typically, that's where they say that they accept microevolution, but not macro, pretending that there's some boundary between the two. OFNF himself said that evolution could only occur within biological limits. Uh, I think there's a fair amount of uh, common ancestry, but I, I'm certainly not uh, an advocate of uh, universal common ancestry. The theory is perfectly valid at that level of minor changes that do not produce new kinds of organisms and that, above all, do not add to the genetic information. Breeders are able to produce change only within boundaries. However, when I showed him my list of evolutionary facts again and asked which of these facts he accepts, 
OFNF said he rejects them all, such that he doesn't accept any degree of evolution whatsoever. Hopefully, as we progress through this conversation, we'll find some pretty compelling evidence for evolution. Right now, it's not looking too good. I had already shown him an overwhelming preponderance of com very compelling evidence, but I think he rejected that whole list without even looking at it, because when I pressed him again on the first three, he flip-flopped again. I explained that to reject these means that it would not even be possible to derive new breeds of dogs without evoking a creative miracle. So he admitted that he answered incorrectly before, but he still won't admit that evolution happens. Not even microevolution within breeds of a single species. He won't admit that, and no matter how many times I repeat the question, he refuses to explain why. OFNF imagines that all these facts can be dismissed as if they won't even be facts anymore if there was any aspect of biology that we don't yet understand. The typical creationist tactic, and you can verify this by listening to any of my online debates, is to ask questions you don't want the answers to. Then when your opponent shows that he knows the answer, interrupt him. Stop him from giving that answer and ask him another question until, as they put it, you get to a point where you can't answer. If you can't answer one question out of ten, that means they can dismiss every answer you've already shown that you know. In their mindset, if there's anything you don't know, it means you don't know anything. You have to know everything to know anything, and they'll often say so. Conversely, they seem to think that if they don't give the answer for anything, it means they have the answer for everything, because not knowing anything means knowing everything. So OFNF repeatedly ignored my direct questions and only asked me questions that he didn't think I could answer. He didn't think that a protein or gene could evolve into a different protein or gene. Maybe he didn't know about missense mutations. Maybe he thought that all mutations were silent and that genes composed of a different configuration of different amino acids at various locations will still produce identical proteins. I don't know what he thought because he wouldn't answer my question. He said that blind chance wouldn't work when there were multiple mutations required to convey a beneficial advantage. So I asked if he would accept the documented identification of specific mutations producing new genes with beneficial effects. But he wouldn't answer that question either. He gave me an ultimatum that if science couldn't explain protein folding, then evolution was dead in the water. So I showed him those explanations from a lesson on cell biology from the University of Arizona and a genetics primer from Indiana University. OFNF refused to admit that science had explained this, as if both of these college courses got their instructional materials wrong. He said he could prove that, but of course he can't. That's why he didn't. At ten pages into the discussion, I complained that he keeps ignoring all the questions he needed to answer before we could begin. At twenty-four pages in, I'm still repeating those same questions, and he's still ignoring them. But apparently, he has the evidence. He has the proof of evolution. He just first has to educate us, apparently. So, hold on, it's still coming. Finally, he admitted just what I predicted, that he's just dismissing each individual element on whatever excuse he can so that he can ignore the overwhelming preponderance to look instead for what he calls the magic bullet. His excuses sound a lot like this. So where is this forest? Is it this tree or this one? Would you please point out to me which of these trees constitutes this forest? I really want to see this forest you believe in, so why won't you show me the evidence? So as I continue to try and get Aaron Rod to give us his proof of evolution, he goes and posts this video, and here's what he says. Now how would you explain this? Why is it that absolutely all the evidence we ever find is concordant with or indicative of evolution? And why is it that absolutely all the claims of creationism are either unsupported absurdities that can't be tested or unsupported absurdities that have already been disproved? There's a nerve called the recurrent laryngeal which runs from the brain and its end organ is the larynx and you think it would just go straight there. But in a human what it does is goes down into the chest, loops around one of the main arteries in the chest and then goes straight back up again. Obviously a ridiculous detour. No engineer would ever make a mistake like that. Of course, the only thing that's been disproved is this idea of bad design. No, there are many designs in biology that are so bad they're indefensible, and no one has ever disproved any of these bad designs. Time and time again, evolution have pointed to what they thought was bad design, but later turned out to be actually just some genius design. And I'll post a link in the description. But he didn't. The link he posted was from an intelligent design propaganda mill, and it wasn't relevant to the laryngeal nerve of a fish or a giraffe or anything in between. What's more... Apparently, 
evolution, random mutations, and natural selection are not smart enough to figure out how to reroute a simple nerve. But an intelligent designer would be able to do that. So OFNF apparently knows that this is a bad design. He just won't knowingly admit it. But through all this, evolutionists like Aaron Raw seem unfazed by it. Because to them, if it's a bad design, then that means God wasn't involved. And then if it turns out after all that it's actually a genius design, then they're just like, well, that's amazing what evolution can do. See, to them, evolution is true either way. Yes. See, once something has been shown to be a fact, then it is verifiably true. Likewise, when something has been shown to be false or disproved, like biblical creationism, then it's not true and that won't change. Once it has been disproved, it can't be resurrected, regardless whether any God proves to exist or not. Evolution is still a demonstrable fact and the Bible is still a bunch of falsified fables either way. Now, the nerve in the giraffe's neck is just another example of this. See, Aaron Ra has never provided a single piece of evidence as to how the giraffe, or the giraffe neck, could have evolved. He hasn't done that at all. All he's done is he's provided a religious argument against design, and he wants to then claim that evolution is true by default. Wrong. What I showed was scientific, not religious. And it isn't that evolution is true only if creationism is false. Evolution prevails and creationism fails, each on their own merit or lack thereof. The evidence I did provide was a homologous structure which is highly conserved among tetrapods and matches the evolutionary development. It is thus exclusively concordant with evolution and contradicts intelligent design. It turns out the laryngeal nerve first evolved in fish-like creatures as a direct link from the brain to gills near the heart. Over millions of generations, this nerve gradually lengthened, each small step always simpler than a major rewiring to a more direct route. Not only is it grossly inefficient, in this case it is even an example of attenuation. As an engineer, OFNF would know that, but as a creationist, he's not allowed to knowingly admit it because of the implications. So he has to make up some excuse, any excuse, even if it makes no sense. So apparently, the nerve is routed that way because it used to be a fish. Which is an odd conclusion, really. You'd think that it might be routed that way due to its morphology during early development. I'm guessing that the heart and nerve probably developed before the long neck did. So, sure, the nerve formed before the long neck did. But that doesn't mean it happened in the fish millions of years ago. Maybe it happened in early development before the neck grew out. But that doesn't explain why this trait is conserved among tetrapods. Only evolution explains that. Apparently, these evolutionists have never heard of design constraints. Yet that is exactly the point that Dawkins was describing in this very video. A designer has foresight. Evolution can't go back to the drawing board. Evolution has no foresight. Because evolution is real, it has to conform to the laws of reality. I did a whole series on the design constraints of evolution. The series is called Falsifying Phylogeny. But the limits that OFNF was talking about have never been identified by science because they don't exist. Now, I don't know if this is out of desperation or what, but one of the creationists who was debating on this League of Reason thread ended up getting banned, which is really ironic because Aaron Raw wanted to move the conversation here in order to ensure that no one got banned or censored, because, according to him, only creationists do that. But as it turns out, a creationist on there who was asking Aaron Raw for evidence ended up getting banned. Apparently, it's okay when atheists do it, and even with very vague and ridiculous reasons, such as grow up pudding. So apparently, this is what we can expect when we ask evolutionists for evidence of their theory. What really happened, and you can still see this in the thread, is that eQuestions, posting incognito, deliberately antagonized the moderators despite their warning that he was violating their rules of conduct. Consequently, he was temporarily suspended, and none of his posts were deleted or censored. OFNF knows this, and yet he still says, And when you ask for scientific evidence, they'll ban you. They'll censor you. So, OFNF is not above bald-faced lying. 
In the next thread, he challenged me to show a scientific explanation for a biochemical pathway to create the first ATP motor. Intelligent design websites assured him science could not explain this. So he got quite upset when I showed him exactly what he asked for. He doesn't understand hypotheses, so he said it didn't count as a scientific explanation, even though it came from peer-reviewed journals. Then he said it didn't count as a biochemical pathway either, even though the text describes itself as such. So I turned to a Ph.D. professor of biology that I happen to know, and he said, That paper is a scientific explanation of the origins of the first ATP motor that uses the chemical properties of simple membranes to explain the properties of and driving forces behind ATPase. It is exactly what he asked for, and now he's just making excuses. The ATPase certainly is a component of a biochemical pathway. As the paper explains, it's part of a cellular maintenance pathway that couples ion pumps and ATPA synthesis slash breakdown. OFNF cannot show even one instance in the actual scientific literature where evolution was contradicted or creationism was supported, but he won't admit that he can't cite any such example. He can't cite any documentation of the type of limits he insisted evolution has either, but he won't concede that such have never been indicated or discovered. He can't cite any peer-reviewed documentation of any complex organ which could not possibly have been formed by numerous excessive slight modifications, but neither is he honest enough to admit that science has still never found one such example. Neither is he honest enough to admit that evolution happens. Each of these questions were repeatedly ignored for obvious reasons, so he did exactly as I predicted, and this discussion ended the way they usually do, with the creationist defaulting for non-participation, because he is forbidden to admit that evolution happens. Nor can he address any of these facts of evolution, because they are facts, and he knows I can prove it, and that he would have to admit, as a matter of public record, that evolution is a fact.